In this video, we will show how designing a steel industrial building with cranes is different than steel buildings without cranes and what the additional considerations are. We will start by classifying the buildings with cranes. Crane buildings classifications have been established in the Guide of the Design and Construction of Mill Buildings AIST TR-13 as classes A, B, C, and D. Class A is a building in which members may experience either 500,000 to 2 million repetitions or over 2 million repetitions in the estimated lifespan of the building of approximately 50 years. The owner must analyze the service and determine which load condition may apply. It is recommended that the following building types be considered as Class A. Class B is a building in which members may experience a repetition of 100,000 to 500,000 cycles of a specific loading or 5 to 25 repetitions of such load per day for a life of approximately 50 years. Class C is a building in which members may experience a repetition of 20,000 to 100,000 cycles of a specific loading during the expected life of a structure, or 1 to 5 repetitions of such load per day for a life of approximately 50 years. Class D is a building in which no member will experience more than 20,000 repetitions of a specific loading during the expected life of a structure. The next step is to classify the cranes. The Crane Manufacturers Association of America CMAA, has a specification guide which classifies cranes based on the service they provide and the expected load spectrum. Each crane class is associated with an expected life of the crane, the number of load cycles and the average load intensity relative to the rated capacity of the crane. These classes range from A to F. Class A – Infrequent or Light Service Class B – Light Service Class C – Moderate Service Class D – Heavy Service Class E – Severe Service and Class F – Continuous Severe Service the mean effective load factor K is a concept used to categorize cranes within these classes. K is a ratio that represents the average load a crane carries in relation to its rated capacity. This takes into account the variability of loads that a crane will handle over its operational life, where P is the load probability expressed as a ratio of cycles under each load magnitude condition to the total cycles. The sum total of the load probabilities P must equal to 1. And W is the load magnitude expressed as a ratio of each lifted load to the rated capacity. Operation with no lifted load and the weight of any attachment must be included. The corresponding mean effective load factor to each class can be approximated as shown in this table. Fatigue damage can be characterized as progressive crack growth due to fluctuating stress on the member. Fatigue cracks initiate at small defects or imperfections in the base material or weld metal. And it is one of the most common types of failure encountered in crane runway systems. The imperfections act as stress risers that magnify the applied elastic stresses into small regions of plastic stress. As load cycles are applied, the plastic strain in the small plastic region advances until the material separates and the crack advances. At that point, the plastic stress region moves to the new tip of the crack and the process repeats itself. Eventually, the crack size becomes large enough that the combined effect of the crack size and the applied stress exceed the toughness of the material and a final fracture occurs. In Table 11-1 are estimates of the number of cycles of full uniform amplitude 
for CMAA grain classifications A through F over a 40-year period. The number of expected cycles in the design life shall be used in equation A-3-1 of the AISC specifications to determine the allowable stress range. The average stress range predicted to happen in the extreme majority of these cycles shall not exceed the calculated allowable stress range. The constant CF depends on the stress category obtained from the AISC specifications. Some considerations need to be taken into account for grain runway fatigue. For tension flange stress, when runway girders are fabricated from plate material, fatigue requirements are more severe than for rolled shape girders. Stress category B is required for plate girders as compared to stress category A for rolled shapes. Stress category F applies to fillet welds that connect the web to tension and compression flanges. Cracks have been observed in plate girders at the junction of the web to the compression flange of runway girders when fillet welds are used to connect the web to the compression flange. Such cracking has been traced to localize tensile bending stresses in the bottom side of the compression flange plate with each wheel load passage. Each wheel load passage may occur two or four or more times with each passage of the crane. The calculation of such highly localized tensile bending stresses is so complex and unreliable that the problem is buried in conservative detail requirements. To reduce the likelihood of such cracks, AIST TR-13 recommends that the top flange to web joint be a CJP weld with fillet reinforcement. Tiebacks are provided at the end of the crane runway girders to transfer lateral forces from the girder top flange into the crane column and to laterally restrain the top flange of the crane girder against buckling. The tiebacks must have adequate strength to transfer the lateral crane loads. However, the tiebacks must also be flexible enough to allow for longitudinal movement of the top of the girder caused by girder end rotations. The tieback must also allow for vertical movement due to axial shortening of the crane column. Fatigue cracks have occurred at the connection between the bearing stiffener and the girder top flange. The crack occurred in details where the bearing stiffener was fillet welded at the underside of the top flange. AIST TR-13 recommends that CJP welds be used to connect the top of the bearing stiffeners to the top flange of the girder. The bottom of the bearing stiffeners is preferred to be fitted to bear on the bottom flange without welding. All stiffener to girder web welds should be continuous. The same recommendations apply to intermediate stiffeners. Fatigue must be checked where the stiffener terminates adjacent to the tension flange. This condition is addressed in AISC specification Appendix 3, Table A-3.1, Section 5.7. Cap channels or cap plates are frequently used to provide adequate top flange capacity to transfer lateral loads to the crane columns and to provide lateral torsional stability of the runway girder cross-section. It should be noted that the cap channel or plate does not fit perfectly with 100% bearing on the top of the wide flange. The tolerances given in ASTM A6 allow the wide flange member to have some flange tilt along its length. The plate may be cupped or slightly warped or the channel may have some twist along its length. These conditions will leave small gaps between the top flange of the girder and the top plate or channel. The passage of the crane wheel over these gaps will tend to distress the channel or plate to top flange welds. Because of this phenomenon, cap plates or channels should not be used with class E or F cranes. 
Because of the reduced fatigue life for intermittent wells and the potential stresses caused by a gap under the cap channel, it is recommended that only continuous wells be used to connect the cap channel to the beam flange. To eliminate the fatigue problems associated with the cap channel wells, angles can be welded to the top flange of the runway girders to provide the required lateral stability and to transfer the lateral loads. The crane column cap plate should be detailed so it does not restrain the end rotation of the girder. If the cap plate girder bolts are placed between the column flanges, the girder end rotation is resisted by a force couple between the column flange and the bolts. This detail has been known to cause bolt failures. Preferably, the girder should be bolted to the cap plate outside of the column flanges. The column cap plate should not be made overly thick, as this detail requires the cap plate to distort to allow for the end rotation of the girder. The girder to cap plate bolts should be adequate to transfer the tractive or bumper forces to the longitudinal crane bracing. In the next video, we will talk about the magnitude of the loads caused by the cranes, what types of loads are caused by the cranes, what load combinations to use when having crane loads, and how to make sure that the structure can withstand them all safely. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thank you for watching.